Pleased to have Dr. Robert Boucher with us today. He serves in the Orange County area, and so we're very, very happy to have you today. On Tuesday, uh, during the day, this was one of the days during Pascha where our Lord had many, many, many conversations. Throughout this whole week, actually, he had quite a few conversations with, uh, with uh, the people that were in Jerusalem and private conversations with his disciples. Uh, among those conversations was a little excerpt that's only mentioned in the book or in the Gospel of John. And it's a very important one. In it, he reveals to us a spiritual truth, a spiritual equation, if you will. Just like we have one plus one equals two, this is an equation of spiritual reality. I will read the piece from you for you, and we'll talk about it together. Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them, saying, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. The spiritual truth is that if a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it produces much grain. But if it remains alone, it dies alone and it does not produce any grain. What is this ground that he's talking about? What is the grain? Well, the, the grain is ourselves, our, our own bodies, our own will, our own desires. And the ground is the lowest thing, and death is the ultimate extreme. So unless I am willing to drive my will, to drive my desires, to abase them completely to the ground, and embrace humility, and deny myself, then I will be unfruitful in my service, in my life in my spiritual life. And I hope you don't think that I'm up here talking to you because this is something that I've attained. But this is more for me than it is for anyone else. Um, this week, more so than any other time during his life on earth, our Lord focused on humility and emptying the, the himself. We see it especially, obviously, during uh, Covenant Thursday when he sits and washes the feet of his disciples. And he tells them that the, the, uh, in, among the Gentiles, the rulers were lorded over them, but it will, shall not be among so, it shall not be so among you. He who is greatest will be the servant of all. And then of course, the ultimate self emptying is when he ascends on the cross and he dies on the behalf of mankind. And he gives himself for the life of the world. And so, Holy Week for us is a time to remember not only our sins, but it's also a time for us to remember His sacrifice. If I put these two things where they belong, then it's only natural that I embrace humility. It's only natural that, that I remember the reality of my situation, the reality of His sacrifice. So, if I sit there, if I'm in my room, and I have the icon of the crucifixion, and I close my eyes and I picture that I'm standing there at the, the foot of the cross and St. Mary's there and St. John the Beloved is there. And we're looking on someone whom we love dearly and we see that his skin and his body has endured much suffering 
much torture. We see that he's extremely dehydrated, very weak. While in the meanwhile, the entire time, he uses very few words to speak while he's on the cross. But the vast majority of the words that are said have very little to do with his condition, with himself. He never says, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm suffering. This shouldn't have happened to me. I don't deserve this. Just wait three days and you'll see what happens after that. His main concern is still the people around him. He says, son, behold your mother. And he says, mother or woman, behold your son. And then he tells the thief, you will be with me in paradise. And then he prays for those who crucified him and he asks God to forgive, he asks the Father to forgive them. The very it seems to be that the, the very last concern of his is his own self. And so if I sit there and I'm watching this image, I'm meditating on this image, the last thing that I'm gonna really be thinking of is myself. It's hard for me to look at that and think, you know, well, my condition in life is so bad. Uh, you know, there's some people who are very mean to me at work or they they persecute me. They treat me unfairly. Uh, one time I was uh, walking with my father of confession and he had he was talking about humility uh, during his sermon. And uh, so after the sermon, I said to him, we're alone and I said Abuna can you teach me how to be more humble and uh, he looked at me and he said are you Trump and I said I was confused because during that time Trump was the president so he was basically telling me are you the president are you some man of note that we're that we're not aware of are you more important than uh, and you really think you are? And so I was sitting there thinking, I was completely expecting something different. And then he was quiet for a bit and he said, if someone is standing and someone comes along, they can push him and they'll fall to the ground. But if someone's already on the ground, then you make them fall. No. Oh. And he said, that's humility. If you humble yourself to the ground, you'll never fall. If you find yourself standing, you'll there's always a chance that you will fall. And so that is the reality of humility. And that is where Christ asks us to go during this week and asks us constantly to go when he tells us to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him. A little bit later, months later, and again, I was with my father in confession and we were taking a walk and we were talking about different things and he asked me what was the gospel about today and it happened to be one of the things that our lord discussed today and it was a very sharp rebuke to the to the scribes and the pharisees and this is where he announced the woes to them woe to you scribes and pharisees and he would just list it off many 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 condemnations now well, keep in mind this is the same person who had a conversation with a woman who had had five husbands. And he asked her, and she said, give me some of this water. He said, okay, go get your husband. And, uh, and she said, I have no husband. And he says, bravo, you've had five. And the one that you're with now is not your husband. So he's praising her for an obvious lie. But he finds the little bit of truth in, in the matter so that he can praise her. The same is true with every sinner that he came across. He was very, very compassionate to tax collectors, extremely compassionate to uh, prostitutes and all kinds of, of people that society did not want. But the very people that we would expect from God to be compassionate towards or to love, those were the people that he was the most rebuking of. And that would be the Pharisees and the scribes. And... Uh, my father of confession said he was, he was extremely harsh with them because they took something that wasn't theirs. They took his glory. And if you think about it, what makes people like the saints that we have in the church special? What makes some, somebody like Pope Corpus? Or what makes somebody like 
say Mina, say Joy, what makes them special? If you take away Christ from their lives, they're just like everybody else. The thing that made them special was his presence in their lives. Their, the unity of their life to theirs. Now, if they began to take that glory for themselves, they're taking something that's not theirs. And that's what the scribes and the Pharisees did. And that's why he was not happy with them. And he said, our saints, our forefathers, the saints, they went in the complete opposite direction of everything that society told them. And we see it, I think, more so now in today's society than we have ever seen it before because we have different tools of manifesting it, especially things like social media. Everything's about me, 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 me. Look what I'm having for dinner. Look at the car, the car that I drive. Look at my house. Look at uh, where I went to school. Today I uh, met so-and-so. Everything is about every aspect of our lives, and it's really focused around me. So that is a, a big driving force in our society today. What is a, a, a very famous phrase that we hear all the time? You do, you. You need to worry, stop worrying about everybody else and love you first. We hear that a lot, you know. And yes, it's it's there might be some parts about it that are good and some parts that are healthy. I shouldn't I shouldn't put my life uh, and my needs off to the side, brush it off to the side at the expense of others in an unhealthy way. There's a healthy way to do things. But many of the times we take the negative of it and that's what we exalt. I speak of myself primarily more than anyone else. And so we find that the saints knew the path to Christ was the path that is opposite of everything that society is teaching. If we walk down that path, we're going to find him. Okay, And one thing that we, we kind of have to meditate about, or I would like to meditate about, is the lives of the saints real quick. So if we look at somebody like Pope Rose, we think of what's the first thing everyone thinks about? The miracles. We think that his life was just amazing. And it really was in the sense that Everything he did was was wonderful. Everything that every touch, every life that he touched was was uh, affected. I remember hearing a story where he simply is walking and he always had a shawl on, and his shawl fell. So he, as like anybody else would, he grabbed it and he threw it over his shoulder. And as he threw it over his shoulder, somebody in the back who was demon possessed screamed, and the demon was cast out. That was the kind of power that God had given him, and we think. You know, this is an amazing life that he lived. What a lot of times we don't see, we don't hear, we don't think about is the amount of suffering that he endured. We know for sure that there were two different plots and there's speculation that there was actually a third plot to remove him from the papacy. Uh, and during that entire time, he never defended himself. He never went and, let's say, for example, exiled the, the metropolitan that was trying to do that to a monastery or took away his diocese or things that we, we've heard of other people having happened to them. He just sat quietly and he would pray. He had a periodical that was circulated where in which it would, uh, they would accuse him of, of being a thief. They would accuse him of mismanaging church funds and all kinds of stuff. And it, would, it ran daily for about three or four years. And when it stopped running, because it would be delivered to his doorstep daily, and he would read it daily. Then a few days went by where they didn't; uh, it wasn't delivered, and he asked about it. Where is this magazine? Turns out the government shut it down because it was causing problems because the president of Egypt didn't like anyone speaking like that about the patriarch. And so he was upset. His disciples said, I thought he would be overjoyed. Well, he wouldn't stop. He didn't stop until he found uh, employment for each employee of that magazine with a different publication because he said 300 employees depend on the income that is generated from those jobs. That is not something that you and I would do, or, or I'll speak for myself. That's not something I would do. I would say, 
you know, he got their, their just deserves. But in reality, he wasn't like that. He embraced humility. He embraced self-emptying. Um, you know, his story, the stories of his suffering go on and on. I don't want to, you know, spend much more time on that. Um, I will say one last thing is I, his disciple, again, was said one time he mentioned that he was walking by his door or uh, to the, the door to his cell. And he heard him inside sobbing like a child, crying. And he was saying, which is essentially a loose translation. Is It's so, things are so bad. Things are being thrown at me from so many different directions. I don't realize where the blows are coming from. I can't keep up with where they're coming from. And he, again, he mentioned that a similar situation happened where they were driving and he was in the backseat crying. So this is something that was very, um, is very normal in his life. We only see, you know, the, the after effects. We only see the glory that he has, that God has given him. But we don't see the, the suffering. We didn't really experience it. Not a lot of people talk about it. Uh, I know that some of you were lucky enough to recently go see a movie, The Man of God, about the life of St. Nectarios. And again, you see how much suffering he endured. And he didn't say anything. Just suffering, suffering, suffering. And they bore it quietly. They bore it without defending themselves. And so what is this? Does this... Does this behavior, does this life have a word uh, that describes it? Yes, that word is kenosis or self-emptying. And this word is used specifically by St. Paul in the epistle to the Philippians. And I want to read a piece of it for you. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And so Christ himself was the example that the saints followed. He emptied himself. That's what kenosis is. It's self-emptying. It is the act of removing every rank that you have and giving it all up. Giving up any power that you possess. And some of some of the translators will translate verse 6, who start, which starts out as who being in the form of God. Instead of who being, they translate it because. Because being in the form of God, he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he emptied himself. Meaning, the difference is this. He gave up his position. He gave up his power. He gave up his, his blessedness, his rank, his glory, because he is God. Because that's what God does. And if we are imitators of God, if we are trying to live the life of Christ, then this is what we have to do. This is what is God like, to empty ourselves as he commanded us. But just as he emptied himself, there's also what comes after that. And the very uh, next verses in Philippians explain that. Therefore, God also has exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And the Lord said this clearly when he was talking to his disciples and the multitudes. He said to them, He who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So this is what we call an inversely proportional relationship. So the more you go down, the more you are exalted. The more you try to exalt yourself, the further down you go. And if we look at the saints... It seems to be that the more that they suffered, the more power, the more honor, the more the blessing, the stronger their intercession seems to be. When we look at, for example, uh, St. George, what, do we, what is his title? He's the what? The Prince of the Martyrs. How long did he suffer for? We all know from the Dixology. How many years was he in prison? Seven years. Seven years incarcerated. No hope of getting out. Okay. 
We look at Saint Mina, same thing. Pope Carlos suffered his entire paper, actually his entire life. Saint Nectarius, same thing. In these, the last three, I mention them specifically because they they tend to carry the title Wonder Worker. It means that God, because they suffered and because they suffered in in silence, granted them the gift of performing miracles, sometimes during their lives and sometimes after their lives, and continue to do so. So the saints suffered silently, but where did they where did they learn this from? Where did they learn this from the Lord? We have it documented. It's well documented in the Gospels that his his trial in front of the Sanhedrin, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, it was essentially accusations, 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 silence, 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 and then they'd ask him a question. He would answer that one question. He'd lose their minds, tear their clothes, and that was it. And, it, and in the Gospel of John, it's mentioned that they kept accusing him, accusing him. And and Pilate was stunned that he didn't answer him, that he didn't answer these accusations. He says, do not hear what they're saying about you. And then he asks Christ's question, and Christ still remains silent. And his answer is, or Pilate's answer to Christ is, are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you? So the entire time, he bears it silently. This is where the saints learned it from. They didn't get it from somewhere else. They learned it from their master, the one who they follow, the one who they tried to unite their lives with completely in every way. And if we look at the life of Christ, especially the last week, it was centered around suffering. Christ, during the last week, he stayed in a village. Do you guys know the name of the village? Do you remember what the name is? The name of the village is Bethany. What does Bethany mean? A house of suffering. When they came to arrest him, he was in the garden of Gethsemane. What does Gethsemane mean? It means the oil press or the olive press. Because the way that you make olive oil is you take the olives and you grind it, grind them essentially under a large stone wheel. And that brings out the oil. He was going to be pressed. And if you look at where they chose to build the temple, it was built on a place called the threshing floor. That's where you put the wheat. And then it's smashed either by being beaten by rods or by having something heavy roll over it. And that separates the husk, which is the outer part that's to be discarded, from the valuable part. So his entire life was, was on earth was meant for him to suffer. And if you read even the Gospel of John, it has a very interesting part that it's mentioned today. That during the Passover, he went up in secret because they were looking to kill him. So you can imagine, it's hard for me to imagine that the second person of the Holy Trinity, the creator of the entire cosmos, the one by whom we all simply exist because he wills it, is going up in secret to Jerusalem because they want to kill him. But this is the kind of self-emptying, this is the kind of kenosis that he taught us and wants us to have. So at the end of the dialogue that we mentioned above, the Lord says, he who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. So if I want to know if I'm following him, following him, if I want to know that I am his servant, I have to ask myself, is the Lord here? And if I am in a place where he is, then I am his servant. I am following him. But if I am in a place where I know for sure that he cannot be here, then I am not following him. I am not a servant. And that's a simple truth. And so I constantly have to ask myself, is the Lord here? And he made it clear to the apostles from the beginning what the plan was. The plan was the cross from the very beginning. Multiple times he would tell them that he was going to suffer. And he would make it very clear, even telling them sometimes that he would be crucified. But he would tell them that he would rise again on the third day. Sadly, though, the disciples and the apostles didn't remember this. But it was his enemies that remembered. And they asked for a guard to be placed at the tomb. Because we remember he said that he was going to rise in three days. And so, in short, he was born to die. His life was meant for death. It's 
that that's what he came into the world for. And there's an, an interesting icon, you've probably seen it before, called the icon of Our Lady of Perpetual Hope. And it's you'll recognize what I'm describing. It's a it's an icon where of Saint Mary holding the child Jesus, and he has one sandal that's kind of hanging down. And in the corner, it has a Archangel Michael in the second corner, uh, Archangel Gabriel. One of them is holding a cross. One of them is holding a spear with a sponge on it, and other instruments of torture. And what the the iconographer is trying to depict, depict is. If you look at the face of Christ, he's not looking at St. Mary or the archangels. He's looking at, at a, in a distance, a way off. And he was trying to depict that he would have visions of his torture that he was going to endure as he, when he got older, when the time came. And they were sometimes fearful, and he ran towards his mother. And he was running so quickly that his, his, ink, his uh, sandal was coming off of his foot. And so she held him in his arms, in her arms. And that's why his handle, his uh, sandal is hanging on him. So he was born to die. He knew what he came for. And if we want to follow him, the end is the cross. But only to be resurrected with him in glory. With him to whom is due all glory forever.